please join me in welcoming Patrick Drain. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you very much for that uh, uh, thorough uh, introduction. Uh, the, the topic that I'm going to talk about is sports engineering in general, but I will be talking uh, quite a bit about baseball. Um, but I'm sort of leaving that for the, uh, the, the second half of the talk. And I'm going to start out with uh, some, some things about sports engineering. I'm not sure if anyone's ever heard of sports engineering. Um, I love having people ask questions during a, during a talk, but I've been asked to, to have all you refrain from, from giving those, uh, for all those questions until the end. So, um, so I'll go through the material and, and save those questions uh, for the end. So, um, so what is sports engineering? Uh, sports engineering is a field that's been developing over the past 16 years. Um, as part of the introduction, uh, you were told that uh, the uh, sports engineering conference began in 1996. Uh, it started in the UK, basically came out of the UK, um, and it started very small. I think there were about 16 uh, papers presented that year, and it's grown ever since to what it is now, about 150 papers presented uh, every, uh, every two years. But the organization and what sports engineering is is still working at developing uh, what, it, what it is. Um, sports science is a, is a more common term. A lot of sports engineering programs are paired with, with sports engineering programs uh, or, or sports science programs in other countries. Uh, currently, there's no sports engineering programs in the United States. Um, they just don't exist in a, in a formal way. Uh, some of the other terms, and sports science typically refers to, um, uh, to exercise physiology or, or things like that, where you're studying the athlete, you're studying the athlete's performance. Sports technology and sports engineering um, are, are two terms that are still trying to work out what covers what. Um, uh, in terms of sports engineering, I typically try to define it as um, when you have equipment involved, um, either the development, the innovation of that equipment, uh, the understanding of how the player interacts with that equipment, and that's what we basically sort of consider sports engineering. And I'll go through a few, few different topics. Uh, to just recap a little bit here, um, this year we hosted the, this biennial conference that's held every two years um, in Lowell. Um, it had been the first time it was held on the East Coast of the United States. It was only the second time it was held in the United States. Um, and, and past locations for that conference are where there's, there's been uh, fairly large sports engineering programs. They started in the UK. It was held there for two, uh, the, the first two times, and then it went to Sydney, Australia, uh, to Kyoto, Japan. That was the first time I actually I uh, got to go, and, and it's, uh, it's great being able to travel to, to these international conferences and, and meet all the researchers that are, that are working in a, in a similar area. Then it went to UC Davis, um, uh, which is uh, in California. And then it went to Europe for, for six years, um, being in Munich, uh, in Biarritz, France, uh, which is on the Atlantic coast, and, and then most recently in Vienna. And we wanted to bring it back to the U.S. Uh, it had sort of geographically been a while since it had been held um, in, in this neck of the woods. And uh, UMass Lowell, with its uh, experience with the Baseball Research Center, having uh, attended many of these past conferences, we wanted to, to bring it to, uh, uh, to Lowell. So in terms of sports, pretty much any sport you can think of, any sport that you can think of in the Olympics, um, and outside the Olympics are, are covered somewhere uh, within this conference. A lot of the popular ones are golf, tennis. Um, that's where a lot of the history of, of sports engineering, sports science has, uh, had existed. Um, now, a lot of the papers are moving towards uh, swimming and cycling. Those are the two most popular this year. Um, with the, the baseball lab in that, we, we had uh, a strong presence with baseball and, and softball, but there's also uh, topics in fencing, there's topics in, uh, uh, in ping pong and, and 
as I said, pretty much any sport you can think of. The biggest countries where sports engineering exists um, is the UK, um, uh, Japan, uh, Australia, um, and then you start getting to the US uh, and a number of the other European countries uh, that include uh, Austria, Germany, uh, some in France, and then sporadic researchers uh, throughout the rest of the world. There were about 20 different countries represented uh, at, the, uh, um, at the sports engineering conference. And in terms of disciplines, uh, this is where we're still trying to define ourselves. Right now, it's fairly broad. We include uh, aerodynamics, we include biomechanics, we include uh, measurement, instrumentation, sensors, uh, motion analysis, uh, uh, modeling, simulation, and then we look at areas like footwear and sports surfaces and, and all these different areas. So there, there are a lot of things. Uh, right now it doesn't include motorsports, which some people say should be included and some people say shouldn't. So right now, if you sort of think about it from an Olympic sports standpoint, that's pretty much where um, the field is developing and defining itself. So just to pull out a few of the papers uh, that exist in the proceedings, as I said in, the, uh, in the, my description, the, the hardest part of the conference was pulling together the, the um, uh, 146 uh, conference papers that were peer reviewed uh, into the proceedings. Uh, I'm gonna just go through uh, five examples, I believe. Yeah, there might be six. Um, and in these, we have a study of, of the Swift skin, which is a, a multi-fabric speed skating suit um, that was developed for, or debuted, um, in the 2002 Salt Lake City Olympics. The work by these researchers out of, out of Canada and the US, um, they did aerodynamic studies. So this is a, a, a person in a wind tunnel running the, the aerodynamic tests, and they were able to determine that there was a 10.1% reduction in, in the aerodynamic drag associated with, um, with wearing that suit. They also looked at other, um, other suits that have been developed since, and for the most part, in the Salt Lake City Olympics, they, the, the suits um, debuted, the next Olympics competitions, international competitions following that, those uh, suits were used by more and more players and, and more and more companies developed similar suits that, that all sort of gave um, very similar advantage. So then to just go on to a, another uh, topic um, related to swimwear. So a lot of the, the, the scientists uh, they're not all engineers that, that present here. A lot of them are engineers, some are physicists, some are, um, some are, in, are in other fields as well. Um, but there's a lot of work towards modeling. Um, and the modeling really crosses disciplines from, uh, you develop it for swimming, but it, the, the same models are, are often applicable um, when you get to anything where you have fluid flow uh, going over the suit. So that would apply to cycling and running and, and, and swimming and speed skating and, and all those different things. And a lot of the work is trying to develop uh, this. So, so this paper was on developing an anisotropic hyperelastic model um, for modeling the swimwear. Um, they also included, and I just sort of threw this image out here, um, a softening model for dealing with the cyclic loading of the fabric. So with this, there's, there's more and more modeling going into um, how these fabrics work. And fabrics are, are not a simple thing to model. Um, later on in the presentation, I'll talk about some work that we're doing where we're modeling a baseball. And when you've got a baseball constructed of wool and, and rubbers and cork and, and all these materials, developing uh, computer models or numerical models for those um, are, non, are, are not trivial. Um, so this, this paper here um, by some uh, researchers out of Loughborough uh, University in the UK, they actually have a, um, a fairly extensive sports engineering program, um, 
was looking at uh, an assessment of professional gol golf coaches' perceptions. <clears throat> So they were looking at uh, things like how do golf coaches perceive posture, uh, body rotation, um, and things of that nature. Um, this is one of the areas where I'd say, does this belong as part of sports engineering, or is it just research that's useful to sports engineers? Um, and the, some of the applications here is that um, these surveys, basically, of golf coaches can be used towards biomechanical uh, um, research as well as developing technologies to help um, golf coaches um, uh, coach better. So sports engineers are using this research, but not necessarily would I consider this in itself uh, sports engineering. Um, and then another example here uh, a little bit more related to, uh, to baseball by some researchers um, uh, out of uh, the University of Michigan are looking at instrumenting a baseball um, with inertial sensors. So these are sensors that allow for the measurement of, of velocity and angular, vel and angular velocity. So this ball wouldn't be used in the actual game. It probably would, uh, those inertial sensors would be destroyed uh, if you hit a bat. But uh, <laughs> But the, the work allows for this to be used as a, as a pitcher training aid. Um, with this ball, you can measure, uh, you can basically have it tell you, well, the ball curved this much, the ball um, moved to the left, to the right, up, down, um, where did it curve, how did it move? And with that, you can learn a lot about, well, was that a good curve ball, was that a, a good fast ball? Um, how, how should you throw it, how should you get the spin going um, in order to get those, um, uh, uh, those pitches to work. This right now, uh, the, the, the paper is describing something that gives n um, fairly quick feedback. Um, but as these sensors develop further and further um, in the coming years, <coughs> These would be, this would be able to give immediate feedback. You'd be able to basically throw the ball and say, yes, that was good. No, you need to, you need to adjust this. You need to grip the ball differently here or there. Um, and that uh, becomes a very valuable uh, tool. Um, so this last slide shows two papers that, that um, we presented. Um, I'm going to go in mo into more detail on, on these papers. But they related to... Uh, the study of wood bat breakage. So at the Major League, uh, Major League Baseball and, and that, um, there's a lot of wood bats that, that break, especially when you, when you throw on the inside of the plate. Um, and we've done studies over the past four years plus on, uh, 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 on this, looking at uh, the, the durability. So one of the areas here uh, that we're going to look at is, uh, is yellow birch as a, as a wood species. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, what I'd like to do now is, is show you this. It's sort of a synopsis of some of the work that we do in the baseball lab, some of the tools that we have, um, and, and some of the findings uh, uh, and, and models that we're able to generate. So this video right here will give you a sense of why, we, uh, um, why we're looking at wood bat durability and wood bat breakage. Okay, so that video was from a few years ago. Um, but it's a prime example of the reasoning behind the, the research that, that, we're, uh, that we're doing. That uh, failure right there is what we refer to as, a, as an MPF, a multi-piece failure. Um, so the, the research started in 2008 um, when basically Major League Baseball started tracking uh, broken bats. Um, and there was an, a three-month period where there were 2,232 broken bats, um, of which 1,476 of those were single-piece failures, <coughs> which you can see um, here. This is a high-speed video from our... 
uh, from our lab. But basically, you have a failure and it doesn't go all the way through the bat. The bat stays intact. No, no part of the bat goes flying. Uh, more or less, the, the batter just has to go and get a new bat. We're not really concerned about those. Um, what we're dealing with is, is research really targeted towards this 756 that were multi-piece failures. Uh, many of those just fall and, and, and aren't near anyone, but occasionally you run into what we saw in that video where the bat gets really close to a player or, in, or hits a player um, or somebody else. So to just go through a little bit about baseball bats, um, this is a picture of a baseball bat. Are you all familiar with that? Okay. Um, so I've got several baseball bats here. Uh, basically, this is the barrel section of the bat. That's roughly this third of the bat. Um, the taper section of the bat is the middle region where it transitions. Um, the handle of the bat is the, is the narrow portion here. Um, the knob is this little end. The sweet spot is typically located about in the middle of the barrel, generally six inches from the end, uh, from the barrel end of the bat, right about here. Um, the grained properties, this is going to be very important as we talk about this research. Uh, so growth rings, um, I'm sure that many of you, all of you have probably looked at a tree at some point. Uh, the tree has growth rings from, from each year of growth. Those uh, growth rings actually define what's referred to as the radial slope of grain or the radial direction of the bat. So if you look at, at this bat here um, or you look at the, the uh, knobs here, here we're looking at the face grain. Face grain is where you typically see the, the logo on an ash bat. Um, the edge grain is where you see those radial um, those growth rings basically run as straight parallel lines. Um, and you can see those uh, parallel lines up and down here. So that's the edge, um, edge grain. Uh, I have ray packets here. Ray packets are the third direction of the bat. We'll, we won't go into that too much. Uh, but in terms of the slope of grain, uh, the growth rings, you can pretty much look at those and you expect them to run from one end of the bat to the other relatively straight. Manufacturers have been put pretty good at grading those, uh, especially for major league bats. Where there became, became some issues uh, was the tangential slope of grain. And the tangential slope of grain um, would basically be, if you look at this, um, if you could see sort of a, a, uh, lines that would go up and down here, that would be the radial slope of grain. The problem is, is that for maple bats, um, I'm holding an ash bat in my hand. For maple bats, these are all very fine lines. You don't see any, you don't see any channels, and they're, they're really the, uh, that direction is the channels that run up and down the tree that bring the nutrients up and down the tree. And what, um, what we had to do, um, and, and the, uh, People at the U.S. Forest Products Laboratory um, were the, the people that related to the study that really helped find this, is that what they do when they need to, when they need to identify that tangential slope of grain is they put an ink dot um, that will seep along those channels and make those channels visible. If you look at a major league bat, any major league bat that's maple um, on television, if you look closely, you will see an ink dot. Every major league bat that's maple or any diffuse porous wood, which would include yellow birch and, and uh, a few other species, is required to have that ink dot so that it can be graded. Um, that ink dot is a, is a consequence of, of the research, that, uh, research study that, that we're presenting here. Um, so other properties that we look at are the wood species. I've already talked about ash and maple. Um, there, there are other wood species that, uh, that are included, yellow birch. There's oak, there's some Japanese ash and, and, and some others. Uh, there's a few that are currently um, actually on the excluded list, uh, which includes soft maple. 
but now there's actually a, uh, a process by which all, all bats need to be, uh, species need to be approved. Uh, there's the profile, there's the shape of the bat. Um, is it a big barrel bat? Is it a smaller barrel bat? Is it a thin handle? Where's the, where's the taper transition take place? Um, for, for Major League Baseball, most of those are defined by Louisville Slugger, which is the uh, most major bat, manuf uh, bat manufacturer and supplier to, to Major League. And they have models like C270, uh, C271 and C243 and M110 and P72, and those are all the models. And, uh, they're all slight variations uh, in, in the shape, and the shape does matter. And then uh, density as well. So properties of wood, the U.S. Forest Products Laboratory, um, first we had to understand what is the wood that, that's going uh, into these. So uh, Forest Products Laboratory studied dowels um, that had specific slopes of grain, um, uh, had specific densities, and basically measuring the modulus of elasticity, the modulus of rupture, um, how do those properties relate? One of the important things to see in this, because I don't ex uh, expect you to sort of study this too much, but you can see that there's large scatter. If we were testing a material like aluminum or steel, you'd expect these lines to be really narrow, like everything would fit in the red line right there. But with wood, there's much larger variation. Um, there's a lot of areas, there's all the natural variation, um, and therefore you really have to test very large sample sizes in order to get uh, um, a predictive behavior. So this is the dynamic durability system that we have um, up, at the, up at UMass Lowell. Um, and basically what we've got is an air cannon that fires at a bat that's, that's hanging, and we can uh, target a speed, we can target an impact location, and it basically operates like this. Okay, so um, here we have, we use high-speed video because pretty much that's the way that, we, that we're able to, uh, to really uh, do the analysis. So when we sort of have that air cannon fire the ball from, from the right-hand side to the left-hand side, we end up with uh, the ball doing this. And we record these images at, at 3,000 frames per second. Uh, uh, and we're able to get a, a fairly high resolution image that's able to look at where's, confirm the impact point. Um, as you can see, that impact point was, was right around here. Those are pitches that are, we've found that the most, the, the most dangerous pitches are the ones right on the inside or, or off the inside of the plate. I'll just play that one again. And you can see that the, the bat can just, uh, the crack can just propagate um, right through that bat pretty quickly. So as I mentioned before, in sports engineering, often we're using, fine, uh, we're using modeling and simulation, numerical models and finite element models and, and uh, um, uh, computational fluid dynamic models and, and all of that. Uh, in our work, we tend to use finite element analysis, uh, which is breaking up your complex shape, and surprisingly, a, a baseball bat is a pretty complex uh, shape. Breaking that up into very small, little, tiny uh, brick elements uh, that uh, allow us to do analysis like this. So this is uh, done in a, a program called LSDyna. Um, it's, it's a dynamic, uh, explicit, um, finite element code. Um, with it, we're able to get um, uh, the, the deformation, and we're also able to put in a failure criteria. In these models, we're using a strain to failure. So as an element reaches a certain amount of strain, it'll break. 
and therefore, and it allowed it to continue to break and propagate uh, through as long as the strain is above, in this case, uh, 3.5%. And with that, we're able to get very similar failures. So this is, this is the same bat modeled here as we had in this experimental setup. Um, in this case, a 14-inch impact. It was a yellow birch bat. Um, it uh, uh, didn't break at 134 miles per hour, but it did break at 147, uh, a little bit larger range than we like to see, and we're able to get those failures. So here we've got a few videos showing the effect of slope of grain um, that we're now able to analyze within a finite element model that it's very difficult to control. It's very difficult experimentally to say, I want you to send me a bat that has a minus three degree slope of grain, zero degree slope of grain, and plus three slope of grain that are all identical else otherwise. Um, you, you don't, you're not able to get that. Even if you said, well, we're going to average out over five or ten of each, you still would have probably more variation. Uh, so with a model, we can, we can look at this um, more specifically. And we were able to find that the minus three degree slope of grain actually broke at 105 mile per hour impact. And you can see how that right there is where the, the sliver of failure. Um, one thing to note, oops, one thing to note here, the failure is taking place in this direction. That's following that uh, slope of grain. As we go to the zero degree slope of grain, it doesn't break at 125 miles per hour. So going from just minus three to zero um, in terms of slope of grain gives the bat at least a 20 mile per hour uh, uh, larger uh, um, impact that it can withstand. As we go up to 140 miles per hour, this bat's actually breaking as a multi-piece failure. It, it is getting all the way through, um, right in there. And then as we go to a plus three degree slope of grain at 140 miles per hour, it's clearly breaking, but it's breaking in this direction now. The failure will definitely follow uh, the, slope of, the slope of grain. So you just go over um, a few of the things that were implemented as a result of, of the work. Um, there's obviously a much greater understanding uh, of wood bats and, and the breakage. Um, the inspection, there's now an inspection process. So bats are, are inspected by an inspection uh, company, both uh, at the plants and also um, in the dugouts uh, to make sure that they comply with slope of grain requirements. Um, we saw those differences on, on minus three to plus three. That's actually the allowable limits. Um, prior to that, uh, you would find bats that sometimes had a six or a seven degree slope of grain, and it would make a, 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 a tremendous difference uh, in it. The slope of grain uh, has an ink dot requirement as well as uh, limits that I just talked about. The label orientation, so we talked about the fact that that a, um, uh, the logo is imprinted on an ash bat on the face green side. For maple, it actually turns out it's got a different biology. Um, and it's actually stronger in the, uh, by being impacted on the face green as opposed to the edge green. So the label is actually moved because when, bat, when, when uh, batters are, uh, are taught to bat with a wood bat, they're at least supposed to be told to hit label up, which means that they hold the bat in their hands so that they can see the label, so that they're hitting 90 degrees offset the label. Um, with maple, the label had been imprinted on, the, on the, the same side as it was for ash. It's much weaker in that direction, and that was uh, par part of the culprit um, associated with it. Not that players can always control exactly what side, especially when they just rotate it in their hands um, behind their head. Um, wood species, there's also a wood species approval process. Um, so part of the research that we were looking at was, 
what, it, what has to be looked at, how do you study that, um, and we, we studied that for yellow birch, and, and yellow birch uh, fared quite well. Um, and since those changes have been implemented, and most of those were implemented in um, 2009 and some in 2010, uh, and, and manufacturers are getting better at, at complying with them and, and, uh, and that, there has been a 50% reduction, which still rep represents a fairly large number of multi-piece failures. So that work is continuing. Um, as part of the, the process of looking at, at baseball bats um, uh, for, uh, for those studies, we did actually look at some bat performance, and I just wanted to highlight two aspects here. So this property is called BBCOR. I'll, I'll go into that a little bit later. But it's basically a performance metric. These are the impact locations uh, along the, the length of the bat. So here's about six inches which is where we say the sweet spot is. And the sweet spot um, is basically defined as, as this location of maximum performance. In the study, we looked at low density and high density, and we found that those um, basically perform uh, the same. Uh, that's not surprising, but it's, it's good to notice. Um, and we basically came up with what ash, uh, ash is typically used as the baseline standard, and ash hit a maximum of about 480, but, but uh, with the standard deviations taken into consideration, they maxed out at 484. So that is now considered the limit uh, for any new species. And if we look at the average performance over this region, looking at uh, the sweet spot plus or minus a half inch of the sweet spot and plus or minus two inches of the sweet spot, um, we get a limit that's at about 470 in terms of BBCOR. When we looked at yellow birch, um, our, our data showed that it hit about 481, which was pretty much identical to ash, um, and it hit 466, which was pretty much, again, identical to ash. Here we did see a little bit of a difference. Um, actually, if I go back one. The other thing to note here is this scale is on BBS, batted ball speed. It's in miles per hour. It's, it, you can relate to it a little bit better. Um, and what we see is the sweet spot uh, at, at a 70 mile per hour pitch speed and a 66 mile per hour swing speed would hit that ball about 101 miles an hour at the, uh, at the sweet spot. By the time we're three inches off the sweet spot, we're down to 93 and 89 miles per hour. You lose about 10% of the velocity by just being three inches off the sweet spot. Um, and uh, that's clearly enough to not get a home run where here you would have. Um, yellow birch, basically a similar decrease. It also is very difficult to get lots of data off the sweet spot because bats break when you hit off the sweet spot. So now I'm going to just go through uh, a, uh, a little bit of this. I'm running a little long, so I'm going to go through a little bit faster. Um, so some of the research that's been done over the past um, 14 years now um, has related to uh, aluminum bats and composite bats used at the NCAA. Back in 1998, there was pretty much no research going on. Um, wood and aluminum bats existed. There weren't composite bats yet. Um, there were high number of home runs, batting averages, um, and there were some increased safety concerns. So the NCAA uh, put in a, uh, assembled a panel of scientists and engineers to, uh, to look at it, which my boss, Dr. James Sherwood, was, uh, um, was one of those. So in 99 and 2000, um, those issues existed, so the NCAA uh, looked at um, the performance of 34-inch wood bats and basically decided to set a, a uh, performance limit based on the biggest, heaviest um, wood bat being used. And there was a single performance limit. Uh, they used a metric called BSR, standing for Ball Exit Speed Ratio. And that program helped. Um, it definitely helped, but it did need modifications over the subsequent years. Um, at that point, uh, there was a moving bat, moving ball uh, test system. 
where the bat was swung at 70 miles, uh, at 66 miles per hour at the six inch location. And uh, uh, the ball was swung into the impact at 70 miles per hour. And the, the ball exit velocity was measured. Um, also in 2000, there was a juiced ball controversy uh, at the major league level. Uh, in April of 2000, there were an increased number of home runs hit in that month, and therefore they wanted to bl people wanted to blame something, so they blamed uh, the ball. Um, so Major League Baseball contracted us to, to study the ball. We looked at the 2000 and the, at ball and the 1999 ball. Nobody had a problem with the 1999 ball. The balls were pretty well controlled, and we were able to get uh, test results showing that the size, the weight, and the COR were no different. A lot of people wanted to look back at uh, balls from the 1970s and 80s and 60s. The problem with that is when you pull it out of your basement and you say, let's use this ball, um, it's not necessarily the conditions that you can trust uh, that the results would be the same. So for that testing, we used a COR setup um, that you can see here using a pitching machine firing the ball into a wall measuring the inbound and rebound speed. Uh, the COR, the performance, is the rebound speed divided by the inbound speed. Um, and this is pretty much the ASTM standard and, and the standard test uh, still used today, though we've got some new tests uh, that, are, that are in the works. Um, by 2002 and, and then, um, the NCAA still had some, some issues that they were trying to resolve related to moment of inertia, um, uh, which is basically swing weight. Um, they still had some high bat performances that, that were still getting through. Uh, the NFHS, uh, which, was in which is in charge of high school baseball, um, they, uh, they had the same problems as the NCAA. So we were looking more at MOI and, and looking into research on a sliding scale related to the performance of wood bats. Um, and the solution to that was implementing an MOI limit so a lower limit, bats couldn't be, uh, couldn't have a swing weight below a value. Um, and uh, the NFHS put in, uh, basically piggybacked on, on the NCAA uh, rules. So moment of inertia was something that we'd always been looking at. Um, it always came into play, uh, but it's, it's really very important. We actually use uh, this often when we're running tours for high school students and middle school students to talk about it. Uh, one of the things that you can think about when you're, when you're looking at moment of inertia is this bat has a certain weight. Has that same weight whether it's hung this way or, or this way. But as soon as you swing it, it matters whether you're swinging it like this or whether you're choking up on it or if you turn it around it feels really, really light. Um, and that moment of inertia is, is the property that you're able to measure that relates to um, what you're feeling. Um, it's a rotational inertia, so the higher the inertia, the heavier it, uh, it feels. Um, but to measure, typically you can measure that as uh, in, a, in a physics sense of a particle. It's the mass times the, uh, times the distance squared. Um, but when you get into a bat where you don't know where each piece of mass is in there, um, we end up calculating the, or, or computing the MOI by measuring the properties of length, weight, CG, and the period of oscillation in a pendulum. Uh, so for that, we swing the bat either in this pendulum setup as we used to, and now we have a knife edge um, setup where we put a clamp we put in a pendulum uh, oscillation. If you're, as long as you're in the, uh, the small, uh, small angle um, uh, deflection, then you're able to uh, accurately compute the MOI. Um, so then in 2004, and, and since we've actually uh, moved from that moving bat, moving ball setup to an air cannon setup, uh, what we do is we fire the ball at 136 miles per hour at the stationary bat. Um, the bat's on a free pivot so that it can uh, recoil away from the impact. We measure the inbound and rebound speed of the ball. 
um, and we're able to get um, a, uh, a property here called BBCOR. Here, the, the V rebound combined uh, over V inbound combined because um, you actually have to use the moment of inertia in the calculation uh, because what matters, what develops this number is that uh, you need to know the bat out speed, the ball um, out speed, and the bat uh, and the ball inbound speed and the bat inbound speed. The bat inbound speed is zero, <laughs> so that's easy to measure. Um, the, you only need, if you know conservation of momentum, you only need two of the other three. Um, and by using the ball inbound speed and the ball rebound speed, you're able to use the same sensors to calculate that. Um, and you don't need to measure the bat out speed. Um, it works as long as the MOI is not so low on the bat like you get on a, uh, a T-ball bat, for instance, uh, where the ball may keep going forward. <laughs> um, and in that case, you have to measure the bat out speed. Um, so some of the other work uh, that we've been doing over that same period is with, is with the baseballs. Um, so in 2000, there was the juice ball controversy. In 2004, 2003, MLB decided, you know, it'd be better if we studied this preemptively um, and study it on a regular basis so that we can track um, if anything changes um, to, to, to rectify it, to make sure that nothing changes is, is really the way it goes, um, and, uh, and to know that and be able to slap down a report if somebody says, you know, the ball's changing or something like that. Um, so to do that, we look at the seam heights, we look at ball dissection, we look at all these different uh, layers. Um, I do have some cut open balls here if uh, you want to pass these around. Um, If you want to just pass them down the rows, that would. Um, so there's a lot of different materials. What we actually do is we go and we dissect those balls layer by layer by layer, um, all the way from tearing the, the, uh, the cowhide off, going down to uh, a cotton, well, a cement coat layer, and then a, uh, which is over the cotton layer, which is over three different layers of wool that all have different properties. We measure the wool, natural wool content versus, versus synthetic wool content. Um, we do that by submerging it in bleach. Um, it, uh, it's the reason why you don't want to bleach a wool sweater, uh, because you'll end up with holes, because the, the bleach will dissolve uh, in high enough concentration, it'll dissolve the wool. Um, and then you get to the inner pill, which is the, the red rubber ball within, uh, in the inside. And that red rubber ball has has multiple layers as well. Um, so this video here shows why the ball makes such a difference. So this is a 150 mile per hour collision velocity, which is pretty much what it would take to hit a ball uh, to the warning track. Um, and that's the collision um, that's the ball compression that you're getting as the ball wraps around the bat. Um, so with that, um, often you beg the question, or, or the question gets asked, well, how is the ball deforming that much? Um, and what it boils down to is there's an, uh, there's an incredible force involved. So we use this air cannon system right here where we can fire the ball, in this case, at 115 miles per hour uh, for this data set, uh, at 115 miles per hour into a flat or into a cylindrical surface mounted to a rigid wall. Mounted to a rigid wall, your, your dynamics do change a little bit. So that 115 mile per hour collision is equivalent to about 130 mile per hour collision with a bat, um, but still, a little bit lower than that 150 mile per hour collision that we saw there. Um, and what we're able to measure is there's load cells on that cylindrical surface that's mounted to that rigid plate over here. And we're able to, with the data acquisition system, we're able to get the load profile. This system's requiring uh, a sampling rate of 100,000 samples per second. Um, 
the amount of time during the collision uh, that the bat and ball are in contact, or in this case, the bat and the seal plate are in contact, is less than a millisecond. Um, you can see here, these are milliseconds. Out here is one millisecond. Uh, the ball is already off the plate. You know, sort of forget the oscillations here. We're still trying to work those out. Um, but we get a maximum load here of about 7,500 pounds. Um, if you st statically load the ball with 7,500 pounds, you will get about the deformation that you saw in that prior video. Um, it, um, it's, it's an incredible amount of force, um, and it's really due to force equals mass times acceleration. The ball is making, making a turnaround of nearly 200 miles per hour. Um, in less than a millisecond. Um, and that's incredibly high accelerations that generate incredibly high forces and uh, create all that deformation. Um, so some of the other work uh, that we've uh, been doing uh, is in the area of composite barrel bats. So, so I've already talked about the fact that there's, there's wood bats that have been around uh, since, uh, since baseball started being played in the 1830s. Uh, aluminum bats, um, you can see here, have about a tenth of an inch wall thickness. Um, generally fairly uniform wall thickness, so that's changing a little bit in recent years. Those came out in the 1970s, um, initially for Little League, and then uh, they extended into, uh, uh, into high school and college. In the late 90s, and, and and throughout most of the past decade, composite bats have become much more popular. Um, so this is a composite bat. It's about a, it's about a quarter of an inch wall thickness, so it's a little bit thicker. Uh, composites are fiber-reinforced plastics, basically. So there's, there's an epoxy system, which is your resin, your, your matrix material. And then most of, most of the time, uh, it's carbon fiber. Sometimes it's a carbon fiber, glass fiber mixture. And, what happens is that here you've got a surface that can actually start to break down. Um, in an aluminum bat, you don't really have that, you don't have a breakdown. But in composites, there's a breakdown, and, um, and with that, there ended up being some issues. Um, the break-in of the composite bats um, required us to, to do some studies. We were able to find uh, whether it was Little League or whether it was high school or college bats, uh, there was an increase in the performance as the bats broke down, generally. Um, it obviously de uh, depends from design to design as to how much that occurs, but in some bats, uh, you could have a 10 to even 15% increase in performance over the life of the bat. And what players would do when they found that out um, it was more common in softball, but it, it did start happening in baseball as well, is that they'd intentionally break down the bats. They'd ruin some of the life of the bat to do it, but they'd be able to get higher performance. Um, and they'd do things like hitting the bat against a tree or um, driving a car over the bat. Um, pretty much anything you could come up with. Um, what we ended up uh, doing is we actually went out and bought a bat roller. There were companies that actually developed ways of breaking in bats. And we bought this off of a website um, and used it in the research. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a roller, two sets of rollers that get clamped down by a vise and you roll the bat through. And what we'd do is we'd roll the bat through in a very, very prescribed way. We'd listen very closely for cracks. And then what we'd do is we had this system here where we'd look at the barrel compression. And the barrel compression would, um, would reduce. And we were looking for a 5% reduction in the barrel compression. Um, we'd try to get five. Sometimes you'd hear a big pop and you'd get more than five. But our goal was to get five at each increment, and then we'd test the bat for the performance again. Then we'd go back and we'd roll it again, um, 
do the barrel compression, go back and forth throughout that whole process, and get the life, get the performance of the bat over its entire life. Um, that's the process now by which uh, composite baseball bats have to be uh, approved. They're only approved if they go through that more rigorous testing that shows not only at the beginning of their life do they pass performance standards, but throughout their life. Um, some of what we found, we used the barrel compression, which is just giving you a, a load. Uh, but one of the tools that we find in the research um, is looking at the natural frequencies, uh, the hoop frequency of the bat. So if you look here, um, the bat goes, it has a breathing mode, and it goes in and out and in and out. Um, it's breathing um, in the first mode, generally somewhere in the 2,000 hertz region. Um, but what happens is the collision of the bat and the ball takes place in about a thousandth of a second, a little bit under that. If you do sort of the inverse, you find that the ball essentially breathes on the bat somewhere around 1,000 hertz, 1,200 hertz, 1,300 hertz, somewhere in that region. If you get the bat to breathe in and out at that same rate, then you actually get to the optimal performance. Um, and what would happen is you'd start off with composite bats that are stiff down in this region, 24 to 2800 hertz. They're really stiff. The, the ball sees it as, as rigid. Then as they'd break down, they'd move in this direction and they'd move up. They'd move up and this curve basically goes up like this and it would eventually peak. And the reason, so if you got a bat to have a, a hoop frequency of 500 hertz, it would be back to low performing. It would have already gone over the curve. Um, the problem is, is that you never see those because basically that bat would just uh, fold in on itself and, and not get anywhere. Uh, so basically that's where we, where, where we stand right now. Um, in terms of some of the, the current research, we're looking at uh, updating youth bat standards. Uh, they were developed back in the mid to late 1990s, and they really haven't been updated that much since. Uh, so there's some work to, to, uh, to update those, those standards um, and to also look at tamper evidence. So we talked about the fact that as a bat becomes more flexible, its performance increases. Well, what some people um, would do is they'd take out the end cap and they'd shave down the inside of the bat or they'd break down the inside of a composite bat or they'd remove structural components. The NCAA and the high school federation uh, know that they can't necessarily stop people from doing that. But they want to know, they want to make it evident that the bat's been tampered with. Uh, so there's going to be work in the, in the coming years on how to um, how the manufacturers can implement technologies that make sure that the bats haven't been tampered with uh, because that is, uh, that is an issue. And those solutions don't exist yet. Um, so the last thing I was going to mention in the last quick couple minutes um, is some of the education and outreach that we've been doing in the baseball lab and, and through um, the, the, the bat science. Some of it at the middle school level and the high school level is, are, are some programs. This we de developed for a seventh grade program where we're looking at myth busting the myth busters episode on baseball myths. Um, it's a tongue twister. But they looked at some interesting things like uh, humid versus dry ball. Um, and they, they did a really good job with that one. And we've uh, replicated it for these seventh graders and had them participate in the experiments. This program takes about three hours. So, um, Then we look at uh, a corked bat. Um, this one, the Mythbusters didn't do so great. Um, they came up with that a corked bat had half the performance of a, of a, a traditional solid wood bat. Um, I knew that wasn't right, so we went and, and actually did a study. Um, and we got these results, which showed that the corked bat and uncorked bat, if you look at the scale, they're uh, they're essentially identical. Um, what is this, a corked bat? Uh, corked bat is when you have uh, 
basically take weight out of the bat and you, you insert cork or, or some other lighter material into the bat. And then uh, they had a, an experiment where they were knocking the hide off the ball and they, they ran a test where they fired the ball at 200 miles per hour and it didn't knock the hide off. And I was like, well, we see that all the time because our air cannons fire 200 miles an hour every time we're running tests. Um, another program that we've had is where we actually developed a course to teach mechanical engineering uh, properties um, to high school students. And we had them uh, basically construct composite baseball bats um, and learn about composites, materials, um, the, the physics, uh, using Excel to, to generate um, uh, models for moment of inertia and actually developing bats of different moment of inertias. Um, and that was a, a course that ran for a couple of years. We're, um, we're hoping that it'll, it'll come back, but um, it, it ran and it was very successful at teaching a lot of those mechanical engineering skills through, through a, a baseball uh, bat example. Uh, some of the things with the general public uh, among tours and, and other talks is that we recently went to uh, the USA Science and Engineering Festival that was held down in DC. There were thousands and thousands, I think they said something like 150,000 people uh, went through, uh, went through the, the DC Convention Center this past year. And we talked about it and we have a, a little uh, portable air cannon demonstration that we have where, where the kids can fire um, a, a little tiny miniature ball into one of those 18 inch mini bats um, and, and see how it uh, reacts. At the undergraduate level, um, we have internships within the baseball lab where they work on, on the research projects that we have. Uh, most of the students come from the mechanical engineering area, but we've had students in plastics engineering and, and other engineering departments. Uh, and then uh, senior capstone projects at the undergraduate level, uh, we've often had them work on uh, uh, on projects in the lab. One in particular is a humidification system. When we're doing work, uh, the humidity for both the bats and uh, the wood bats and the baseballs is, is very important. What is STEM? What was that? STEM. STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math. It's, it's one of those words that basically, or acronyms that basically describes uh, a lot of educational initiatives. Uh, and then postgraduate, we've had a number of master's thesis, and we, we currently have uh, five master's thesis and two doctoral dissertations uh, in progress uh, within the lab um, right now. And with that, um, I'll finish and uh, um, open it up to questions.